Good evening, everyone. Happy Sunday. Uh, I'm Willa Taylor. I'm the Walter Director of Education and Engagement here at the Goodman Theater. And on behalf of all the staff, all the artists and artisans at the Goodman, I want to welcome you to uh, this conversation that we're having, uh, Men, Masculinity, and Dance. Uh, I am thrilled to be in conversation with uh, two of my favorite uh, dancers and choreographers around. Uh, and this, this panel and this discussion is uh, really uh, a way of exploring themes and issues in our current production of Antonio's Law. Uh, Antonio Suarez's brilliant, wonderful piece. Uh, please, if you have a chance, uh, see it. Uh, because it's really incredible. Uh, so this is just going to be a relaxed conversation. I am going to uh, introduce, introduce, uh, or more so call on uh, Mark and Randy, and they will introduce themselves and talk a little bit about that, and then we'll get right into it. So I'm going to start with you, Randy. Uh, tell us who you are and what you do. Uh, well, good evening. I'm Randy Duncan. I'm a choreographer and a teacher. Uh, my pronouns are he, him. And I teach at Chicago Academy for the Arts. And uh, I'm very, very happy to be here and have um, been doing this work for quite some time. Nice. And Mark? Yes, hello. Uh, I'm Mark Macaranis. Uh, I use he, him pronouns. Uh, I am uh, an assistant professor and the head of the dance program at Northern Illinois University. Uh, I've been a long time uh, uh, dancer and uh, performing artist in Chicago. Uh, and I'm uh, excited to, to be here uh, to, to share in discussion. Well, I'm thrilled to have you both. Uh, Mark, can you talk a little bit about uh, what was your what was the first time you knew that you were interested in dance? Mm, I think you that been dancing uh, all your life. I have been dancing uh, all my life, and um, and to to be quite honest, I I actually started dancing um, because my mother forced me to. It wasn't something that I actually wanted to do. Uh, I would cry when uh, you know. I was brought to the dance studio. My, I thought my teacher was scary. Uh, I didn't know who all the other kids were. And I was like, what is this? I'm sitting down and you're telling me to do these various gestures. Uh, so it was, um, it was a rough go at first. Um, but uh, yeah, I grew up um, you know, at, at a dance studio and I also grew up doing um, Philippine cultural dances. Uh, and it wasn't until high school, probably, that I was like, oh, I think that this is something that I can't say goodbye to uh, when it came time for me to think about going away to school. Yeah. Um, and, and so that was the start of my, my professional dance journey. Yeah. And what about you, Randy? Wow. Well, I've always been interested in dance. Um, I used to watch television. Uh, we, we, of course, didn't have where I grew up at, which was on the west side of Chicago. Uh, didn't know where to begin to start at a dance studio, but um, I would watch uh, Fred Astaire, Ginger Rogers, uh, I mean, all of the dance events that would come on television, Lilius Yoga and You on PBS, uh, Bozo Circus uh, with the acrobats. I mean, I was always interested in moving in a way and stretching and being able to do the splits and so forth. And the only way I knew of that is by watching television. Mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't until West Side Story came along that I saw in 73, I believe on television, that uh, I really became interested in uh, doing that. Uh, seeing those guys, um, do what they did in regular street clothes. And uh, that is really what um, inspired me to become a dancer. Yeah, well that, I mean, that opening sequence is yes. just phenomenal. I mean, it is just incredible. I, first of all, I love that film and, and just the dancing and choreography in it is, is terrific. Have Absolutely. you seen, have you so seen I, the new one? I, no, I was gonna say, uh, uh, have I seen the new one? Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, I will not miss a production of West Side Story. <laughs> I'll be going to the one at the Lyric as well. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. 
So growing up on the on the west side, uh, clearly no dance in school in your schools. Mm-hmm. Um, how did you did you have to audition to go to co- like like what was your trajectory then? So you, you watched it on TV, but how did you actually start to study? Interestingly enough, the following year there was an audition for West Side Story. Uh, an all city high school theatrical troupe production of it. Uh, And um, it was going to happen at the uh, Lyric Opera House. Um, Well, I wasn't old enough. I I wasn't out of uh, grammar school yet. I was in eighth grade. But uh, I was bold enough to go down and audition myself. Now, clearly, I didn't even know what an audition entailed. Mm-hmm. But I, I went there anyway. I heard that they needed acrobats, and uh, so I said, "Well, I could do my little flips that I learned from Bozo Circus." So, <laughs> so um, honestly, what I did was, you know, I was there. They said that I could audition, which I did. There were I don't know about a thousand folks there, a thousand kids auditioning for this show, uh, and. Um, when they asked some of us to go up on stage and learn this routine, um, I did, and, and you know, like never having any formal dance training, uh, I did okay, but I didn't really think I did that well. Mm-hmm. So uh, when they asked my group to go and sit back down for a moment, I then I said, Randy, here's your chance. So I raised my hand and I said, I thought that you guys were looking for acrobats. <laughs> And the uh, uh, the choreographer said, "Can you do any?" And I said, uh, "I said sure." And they said, "Well, come on up here." So all by my lonesome eighth grade self, went up there and did my little round offs and splits and everything that I had learned uh, from watching Bozo Circus. And next thing you know, I was a shark. Wow! And that began everything. And the uh, choreographer asked if I wanted to go and study where she taught, which was at the Sammy Dyer School of Theater. Oh. And I said, sure, yeah. So I, wow. you know, go out there every, uh, practically every day. It was two hours for me to get there from the on the bus, oh. but I did it, yeah. That's incredible. Yeah, yeah. You know, I was I was dragged to dance classes a little like two months <laughs> when I was a kid. And, and it wasn't that I, I, I didn't like dance because uh-huh. I loved social dance. My mother and father uh, would dance in the living room all the time. And yeah. I was always trying to teach my dad like the twist and, you know, yeah. the Watusi and all of the right. latest dances, uh, which he could never get. Uh, but but the class was ballet. And I mm-hmm. just was not into that at all. Was <laughs> when coming from sort of sort of the social dance that yeah. you would do and the cultural dances, Mark, that you were doing mm-hmm. uh, as as you were growing up. When did it click that you wanted really some more formal training? And was it ballet that you thought of? Was it because I would imagine there was not a lot of sort of study of cultural dancing uh-huh. at that time. Correct. Well, Willa, I wanted everything. Yeah. Um, yes, I wanted everything. Uh, so it started with, with ballet, uh, jazz. They didn't have hip hop, hip hop uh, back then, mm-hmm. and um, African dance. Uh, uh, what modern? I was taking it all. Acrobatics. This is where I learned my formal how to actually do the real stuff. <laughs> was there in every day? I said, "Oh, this is how you do it. This is how it's done." Uh, to the point that I was so good that they um, had me start teaching as wow. a as a young kid. Yeah. So oh. whenever uh, one of the teachers were out or coaches were out, they asked me to step in to do mm-hmm. it. Um, I always had a sense of of grace, if you will, or gracefulness, mm-hmm. um, and they saw that, that, um, wow, this kid is different from the others who came there to take acrobatics and tap dance. Uh, the right. school is very, very well known for uh, for tap. The only thing I did not take there at uh, Samuel Dyer was tap. Everything else I did. Yeah. And um, 
I just loved it. I love the way it made me feel. Yeah. And I love pretty things, you know? Yeah. And so uh, uh, it, it was easy for me to take hold of that stuff, which is the reason why I couldn't wait until school was over so I could go catch the bus over there two hours to, uh, to Sammy Dyer. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And they, they made it, uh, they made it fun. Yeah. Yes. Mark, what about, what about you? Yeah. You know, I actually started doing, um, it, at the studio that I was studying at growing up in California, I started out as a tap dancer. Um, really? and okay. yeah, it was, it, yeah. it was all I had known for, for the longest time. And, um, you know, I was really enamored of the rhythms and the complexity and, and finding all of the, um, the ways that my feet could make sounds. Yeah. Um, and, uh, there's a, 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 a sort of the, national philippine cultural dance called tinikling which is done with bamboo sticks and you're sort of jumping in between these like quickly moving um bamboo sticks as they uh sort of uh strike each other um and so you know some of those rhythms and the the quick feet um you know uh were sort of a, a natural parallel for me um but it wasn't until i was older probably high school and then going into college that i started doing um you know, ballet and jazz, and then mm -hmm. finally starting modern dance technique. Um, but uh, yeah, it was a very sort of narrow path. I just didn't know what dance could be. I just knew that I liked doing it. Yeah. Um, and I had no conception really of what a, a life as a professional dancer was yeah, um, or, or, or what it actually meant beyond just being able to dance every day. Right. Right. So, so both of you sort of come through this studio uh, system into um, into college, uh, into sort of these careers. Can you talk a little bit about what that was like, certainly as men of color, to sort of at the high school level where so so much is fraught uh, with tension uh, mm -hmm. around identity uh, as you as you're growing up? Can you talk a little bit about uh, what that was like for you, Mark? Sure. Yeah. So. Um... It was very interesting because the, the small town that I grew up in was about half an hour away from the high school that I went to. And I went to a, a, a private Catholic high school um, that was very different socioeconomically from where I was growing up and where I was dancing. Uh, and so, uh, so I was always, you know, this, you know, I was the brown kid from Delano uh, who came in on a bus every morning to the school to this high school. And so that I already felt a little bit um, of an outsider, uh, but then to be, you know, the, the kid that dances also, you know, was, um, it was really interesting navigating sort of those two spaces because I always felt like I had to be different people in each of those spaces. You know, I, I got to be Mark at school with my friends there. And then I got to be Mark at the studio with my friends there and they never um, coincided. They never coalesced until I went away to, to college and started studying dance at university. And I was like, oh, this isn't just Mark dancing after school. This is Mark dancing at school. This is, this is where I get to do both. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, yeah, so it wasn't until, you know, 18, 19 that I was really starting to put all of those things together um, and, and figuring myself out as a dancer and a performer, um, while also being in, you know, an academic environment. Yeah. Was that the same for you, Randy? Well, actually, uh, I was dancing quite a bit in high school from, from eighth grade, actually. Uh, and then of course the next year going into high school, um, I danced all four years without many people at the school knowing. Now, I went to, uh, to Austin High School, which at the time we had 5,000 students there. Um, and I was known as a singer, as a vocalist, as oh, opposed wow. to a dancer. I would not let anybody know that I dance, mm -hmm. uh, to be quite honest. Cause, right. yeah, oh, there are bullies around, you know, and somebody's always got something to say. Mm -hmm. Um, but I used to coach the cheerleaders uh, with their acrobatics, and everybody wanted to do acrobatics after that. I mean, the football team, everybody wanted to know, Randy, can you teach me? Can you, you know? So there was that, but still they did not know that I danced after school. Um, uh -huh. 
Yeah, and I just kept it away because I, I just really didn't feel that it would be met with any kind of, of, of grace, you know? <laughs> so I waited till I was a senior in high school before I actually performed on stage as a dancer. Uh, wow. All the other time, yeah, all the other time, it was Randy the singer. Um, uh, but other than that, it was like, no, I wouldn't let him or rented the mascot because I, I had joined the cheerleaders in doing, um, uh, acrobatics and tricks, uh, uh, on the floor for the games. And my God, the first time I went out, it, it was so scary. There was such a roar, uh, but a roar, a very positive one from the audience, uh, what do you call them that audience you call them um in the sports i'd say crowd so uh, oh, yeah, crowd. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah it was so funny because i was like oh my god here i go and the, the cheerleaders would would uh would make this um uh kind of alleyway for me to go and do my little tricks uh, down flip flop, flip flop, flip flop, flip flop, you know, and then I'd end up in a split. And the guys, of course, wonder how could he do a split? <laughs> you know, they were just not used to that. But it was it was great. I became very very well known uh, at school for not only for singing but for uh, for this as well. Um, so and it was the first time like? I ever had one. Pardon me. What was the response like that first time you danced at school? <sighs> Oh, people were, uh, they were really quite happy. It was, it was, it was uh, positive because I said, I'm graduating, so I don't have to worry about it now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I am getting out of here. And the girls at school would not let anybody talk against me ever, oh. ever. Yeah. They would stick up for me and, and not that I needed them to, but there they were, you know, so it was uh, it was really a positive experience as far as I was concerned. But I stayed in the closet as a dancer uh, <laughs> at, 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 at the school itself. Yeah. Um, so now I still have these wonderful uh, cheerleader friends who are who come out to see all the professional gigs that wow. I do and some teachers as well. Uh, so it, it, it's fun and it's really been quite a journey. So you both studied dance in college? I studied at Illinois State University um, as a vocalist. Wow. But when I, went, when I went there, yeah, I was on scholarship as a vocalist. But when I got there, of course, they had a little dance uh, uh dance club and uh dance classes and i had a i'd been studying uh, graham with joseph holmes uh chicago dance theater here in chicago uh for several years and so they asked me if um i could teach down there in my freshman year um just some outside classes and i said sure and so they were getting full these uh, classes that everybody wanted to to study this uh, this modern dance that they had never really witnessed before. So I started doing that, uh, and then after a year of being there, I said, "Look, if I'm going to do this, I might as well go on back home and do it professionally. I can always come back to school." Um, this is in that's exactly what I did. I came back and continued dancing with Joseph Holmes uh, after that, um, because yeah, yeah. I didn't need to be there for that. <laughs> and, and, and consequently, as several other universities were trying to get a hold of me to teach there as well. Barra College uh, was one, for, uh, for example, and I taught there for several years. So you studied in, in college, did you, uh, Mark, did, did it include or did you specialize in ballet or? Yeah, so in college, uh, I mean, I attended um, the University of California at Irvine, which is a really fantastic program. Um, and, uh, you know, I was taking ballet five days a week, modern four days a week, jazz three days a week. Um, and so it was really, really rigorous and very intense for me. I got to um, uh, study under Donald McHale for four years while I was there, which was a true gift that I didn't realize until, you know, after I had graduated, how rare uh, an opportunity that was. Um, but I did, you know, I, 
I, I studied ballet very intensely while I was in school um, because, you know, it was sort of ingrained in me that, oh, if you're going to be a dancer, you have to be able to, to be fluent in the language of ballet, even if it's not going to be the career trajectory that you're going to go on. And so that really sort of influenced the way that I thought about how I inhabited other dance classes and other techniques. Um, and it became very formative for me. Um, but, you know, for most of my, my career, I've always, you know, been a, a modern or contemporary or jazz dancer um, in the roles that I've been doing. Um, although that, you know, that thread of, of, of ballet technique has, has always sort of, you know, wound its way through, um, through the way that I move and the, and the way that I work. Yeah. So, so as, as you all were, as you all were sort of coming into your careers, were, were you the only dancers of color, male dancers of color in, in groups or in classes? Was there, did you have sort of a support network uh, around you with other dancers or what was that like? That's a very interesting question because until you just said it now, it never dawned on me mm. that I was really the only one there, both in college and uh, and at uh, Sammy Dyer, taking the classes that I took because they were ballet and what black boy want to go take yeah. <laughs> ballet back in that time. Yeah. Um, and so, I mean, they, they would, again, they were in the tap classes, they were in the acrobatic classes, they might be in some of the jazz, but mm. for the most part, it was me uh, at that school. And uh, that's very interesting. And at Illinois State, I was the only black one there, but it didn't, it didn't dawn on me. I was just there because I loved it and it felt so good. Um, and I was able to create uh, as a young artist as well. Um, so I wasn't looking for anything and I've always had the support of my, of my parents. Mm. And my mom and my grandparents, I always had to support, no matter what I wanted to do, they were there for it. Because yeah. they knew that I was a good kid. <laughs> you know? Yeah, and um, it was wonderful. I, I, I was always self-taught uh just from watching the television shows um is kind of would kind of tell you that as well i mean i uh, was self-taught in uh crocheting uh twirling <laughs> a baton jumping double dutch you know all of that stuff i used to do and i would on occasion play baseball and a little basketball and yeah i had to do it all you know yeah. I, didn't, I didn't want the guys to think that um uh, you know, here's this this Randy kid. He's really different from us. Um, so I had to show them as well. Yeah. You know, a little wrestling and and all of that. So um, I again was was sort of hiding uh, who I really was. Uh, this uh, gentle, graceful creature that loved doing what I did. That most of the black boys did not do at, at, at that time. So uh, I was sort of hiding that by doing all these other things. Yeah. 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 Same with you, Mark, or? You know, it was it was very interesting growing up because, um, you know, the small town that I grew up in uh, was a very, um, uh, there were a lot of migrant farm workers there. And so virtually everybody that I danced with growing up um, was from an immigrant family, either um, either from the Philippines or Mexico. Um, and uh, so I, I feel very lucky that I got to grow up in a, a really diverse place. Um, but uh, yeah, so in the studio, um, at the level that I was at, there was only me and one other guy. And, you know, it, it really engendered a lot of competition between us, you know, for roles. Um, so we're like, oh, we're, you know, they're the, the two top guys. Who's going to get this part or who's going to dance in this section? Who's yeah. going to get the solo? Um, you know, so there was, uh, there was a little friction there. Um, but in college, you know, uh, you know, in California, where I, where I was studying, it, it was also a very uh, diverse place. Um, but, you know, I didn't really think about it either. 
back then. I was just so enamored of the form and the and and being inside of the the dance class and just taking everything in that I just allowed myself to you know be a sponge and absorb it without really looking at some other um, uh, at who else was around me. Um, you know, there were there were a couple of um, times that I I was like, you know what. I, I didn't get a ballet scholarship. Nobody gave me a ballet, ballet scholarship, even though that, you know, I felt like I, I was right for it and ready for it. Um, but the other guys who got ballet scholarships um, generally weren't uh, dancers of color. Uh, mm-hmm. So, um, you know, so that was something that, uh, that I noticed. Um, and I don't know that I necessarily, I can't remember what I thought of it at the time. But it was something that I noticed and it, it stuck with me. It's interesting. I mean, you know, of course, I, I grew up watching, <clears throat> excuse me, I grew up watching Alvin Ailey, um, Dance Theater of Harlem. Mm-hmm. You know, those were the first places that I ever saw Black dancers, mm-hmm. you know. And then, of course, uh, you know, on, on Broadway and touring shows like Hello, Dolly, you know, with Pearl Bailey. But mm-hmm. I didn't see a lot of Black male dancers uh, and certainly didn't know anybody, uh, any men of color who were in the, pro- I went to the University of Texas, none in the program there uh, mm-hmm. at all. And I, and both of you um, teach now. Uh, and I know I've been in your classes, Randy, and I know how much more diverse it is now. Is, is, is that because there's less stigma about being a, um, a male dancer of color? Is it just because uh, there are just more people that are interested in it? What do you think the difference is now? I think it's both. Uh, definitely with all of the special dance programs that have uh, uh, come on, like So You Think You Can Dance and uh, several of the others that are out there now, everybody wants to do it. And they know if they want to be good, they have to take technique classes. And that generally means uh, ballet. Um, mm-hmm. They can go and do all the contemporary that they want, but the basics are uh, for them getting to the top in those competitions is, um, is ballet. And uh, it's, much, it's much easier for them to do all the other work if they do that. But yeah, they are more interested. We're able to offer scholarships to uh, the kids that we want there uh, at, at the academy anyway. And uh, there's some that come in there only having uh, hip hop experience, dance on the street, uh, that's it. And they come in there uh, with their legs all turned in and leave there with them all turned out. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and, and get ballet scholarships to either the schools of their choice or uh, go directly into dance companies, professional dance companies, once they graduate from uh, from there. But it's because they want to do it. It's not because somebody is pushing them to do it. This is what they want to do. And um, so we find a lot more, uh, certainly than when you and I went to school back in the day. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm finding a lot more of the men of color uh, come in as well. And when they can see someone up there teaching who is of color themselves, it makes it a lot easier for them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that, um, you know, at NIU, we're, I'm very, I'm very proud of the fact that uh, three of our four uh, full-time faculty are artists of color. Um, and we have such a diverse student uh, population at the university and even inside of our dance program, which is, you know, relatively small compared to other programs. Um, but uh, our students uh, come from all, you know, such a, a, a breadth of backgrounds um, and identities. Uh, and so it's really great for me to know that they're being served um, in ways that I, I, you know, that I might not have thought about when I was their age. Um, and, and yeah, I think the, and we do have quite a few men of color in our program, um, which is always surprising for, for folks who come to visit the program uh, and they ask me about it. And I'm like, I don't know, we, it's not like we, we go out and like 
say, Hey, you, I think you should come into this dance class. You know, it's just, um, I, I think the that. cultures, you, well, you, <laughs> um, but, uh, uh, yeah, I think the culture has shifted and there is more openness, um, to it. Cause I, you know, I was very much, uh, in the dance closet when I was, uh, mm -hmm. growing up. I didn't want anyone else to know besides the folks that I danced with, cause I didn't necessarily feel safe sharing that part of myself mm -hmm. with them, but it wasn't until, um, you know, much later that I, I realized that, uh, that kids these days have more acceptance and safety inside of wanting to dance um, than I did when I was growing up. It's interesting that you talk about that because in, in Antonio's uh, piece, you know, he talks about sort of being able to use sort of this, this vocabulary of movement of the body to explore like masculinity and who he was becoming as a man. And you and I, of course, Mark, uh, you, you have this great phrase, this, the choreography of identity. And, and I'm wondering, e even coming from sort of a cultural dance perspective where, where that is about sort of celebration of ethnicity and of, of your culture more so than dancing as a as a sort of pastime right mm -hmm. how does that sort of play into both your identity as a as a dancer uh but also as a male dancer mm -hmm. uh as as you think about sort of that trajectory but, but from the um from uh, you know with cultural dances or, or 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 so many social dances really they're all about uh sort of teaching you who you are inside of these uh, spaces. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, in cultural dance, you are the learner until you, you are the teacher. And those are sort of the, um, the spaces that you inhabit. Uh, and then I feel like the same is true inside of, um, you know, uh, the sort, sort of social contexts and gatherings that we find ourselves in. You know, I have to move in this particular way in order to be welcome in this particular setting. Mm -hmm. um, my speech has to be this kind of way. I have to move in this sort of way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I find that in dance, you know, especially in ballet, because it's so gendered, there are, you know, this is how men move. And these are men's steps. These are men's variations. And then there, there are women's steps and women's variations. And, um, you know, women tend typically wear point shoes and men do not. And, you know, men are in charge of lifting and women are not. And women are the lifted and the presented while the men in the back are just, you know, are the lifters, um, which is not always true, but it tends to be sort of a trope in, um, in some of the classical dance forms. Um, so in terms of my own identity inside of that, it's been such an interesting thing uh, because so much of my life now, is, I, I am surrounded um, and I engage with and I talk to other dancers and other folks who are really inside of their bodies. Um, and so whenever I step outside of that, I'm like, oh, there's an entire way of existing that like I forgot about because I just don't, you know, I don't spend a lot, a lot of time outside of my silos these days. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but yeah, I, I, I find it so fascinating to watch social interactions and just sort of be able to track the, uh, yeah, oh, this, this is an idea of masculinity uh, that you have to enact in order to, you know, be perceived as in strong or um, assertive or dominant. And, you know, for women, um, you know, moving in the same ways, it, it oftentimes has negative connotations. Um, uh, and, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not trying to make a, a judgment on it. I'm just, it's something that I noticed. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, I think it's quite fascinating. Well, you think about that performance of sort of masculinity that you did, Randy, playing wrestling and, and, mm -hmm. and playing baseball and having, and being sort of performing male in the way that the culture was dictating you perform male uh, mm -hmm. and then staying in the closet around your dance. Uh, th this is true, um, but, you know, behind it all, I was always more um, informed by beauty, and uh, I would not miss a Miss Continent 
uh, pageants, if you pay me. <laughs> I mean, there was so much tied up into all of what I felt was graceful and beauteous and uh, lovely that that is what really informed me as opposed to coming out of my own body and saying, this is who I want to be, or this is who I am and all of that. It really was, um, uh, uh, mine was codified by watching and looking and loving and, um, and being filled with joy from that. And that is where my choreography comes into play. Uh -huh. um, I can easily just take a story and turn it into something uh, right away. But the the real gift is the beauty that I see coming out of anything that I that I do. Uh, so I don't like put myself on the line and say, "Here's my here's the story of my life." Uh, I have yet to do that. Um, I have not wanted to do that really. Uh -huh. Uh, yeah, it is really about all of those things that surround me that uh, inf informs me of what I'd like to create. Yeah. So I, I, I want you two to talk a little bit about sort of the transition from being a dancer to being a choreographer. And, and where is, uh, where do you think that trajectory goes? Like I, I know choreographers, then uh, you you build dances for multiple companies, uh, it, but thinking about some of the iconic dances like a Revelations uh, mm -hmm. that sort of live beyond uh, the the dance world uh, mm -hmm. to be embraced by by a culture. Uh, talk talk about sort of is it. Is it steps? You are a dancer and then you are a choreographer. Or are you both at the same time? How how does that live? And how does then uh, how then do you think about creating it and putting it on other bodies? Well, uh, let's just say that every dancer is not a choreographer, and every choreographer <laughs> is not a dancer. <laughs> That's very, true. That's very uh, true. Yeah, you could be a sculptor and be a choreographer. Um, you can uh, be a fantastic dancer, uh, but you're not a choreographer. It's a difference between uh, between a musician and a composer. Um, they, you know, a composer can't play every instrument. Uh, yet he can compose <laughs> and put those instruments where they need to be for a score. Uh, mm -hmm. Dancers simply cannot make up dances that well. Anybody? Well, well, let's just say this: they can make up dances, but nobody's going to like them. Okay. <laughs> <You know? laughs> uh, yeah, it could be as pedantic as, as I don't know what. And I have seen it. I've seen it both ways. And there are simply people who are um, uh, who are made for certain things. Um, I happen to feel that I have been blessed with both uh, to teach and to choreograph and at once a point of time actually dance. Um, but that was all a matter of first delivering in terms of a, of a, of a dancer, uh, doing what other people wanted me to do, and then figuring out, is there a way that I could make that different if I wanted to? So I thought about those things. Um, when I first started teaching, I used to write everything down. And then I totally forget what I had written because I didn't want people to think or those students to think, oh, my God, he's got to go over there and look at every little note that he had taken. I again, I did not want that. So I just left my little piece of paper on the side and I started teaching and things were coming to me like water out of a faucet. It was like, oh, this happens and this happens. And, this happens. and it may not have been the same thing that I have written had written on the on the paper but uh it was coming effortlessly so i knew there was something there and everybody can't do that um 
So I, I really felt blessed that uh, I had been given the, the, the gift and the talent to do these things. Um, and just one thing led to another. And so when I stopped performing, I was still able to teach uh, and to bring certain things out of dancers or out of students that they really didn't know that they had. And that is a wonderful feat in and of itself. And then choreographing, I mean, again, I just love it. It's, it's my life, it's my passion, it's my dream to do certain things. Um, I um, tend to use, you know, the, uh, a lot of the urban life that is around us. Um, I use the, uh, the fact that my brother lives in the woods <laughs> down in Dixon. And I kind of use that as well. I use birds, I, I use animals, whatever it takes to make the statement, I use it. So uh, that's kind of how, uh, how I have grown and developed as, as an artist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, um, you know, for me, when, uh, when, when I was performing, uh, I really tried to learn how to be um, both the paintbrush and the painter and to figure out, you know, how am I using my instrument in a way that reveals something that is beyond just a series of shapes or movements. Um, and what does it feel like when I know that I'm doing it successfully? What does it feel like when I feel like I'm giving that to an audience? Um, and that really has informed so much of my teaching practice. Uh, and and uh, you know, and and I, I make choreography for my students all the time. And um, you know, and it's about for me. I mean, my teaching and my choreography practice feel really hand in hand because choreography for me is just a simple you know, as simple or as complex as organizing bodies in space and time and giving them choices. Um, it's creating architecture. Uh, so I can create architecture in the classroom and I can create architecture on stage so long as I'm giving the, you know, the right width and the egress to walk through a particular door or make choices or, or to turn left, turn right, go down, stay low, jump, you know, there are so many options. And and I want to be able to give my students um, the breadth of my own experience, as well as, you know, honor the experiences that they've had that I haven't um, uh -huh. and, and, and make space for that in, uh, in the rehearsal room, in the classroom. Um, but the transition from dancer to choreographer, um, I think uh, for, for some dancers and some choreographers, it's, uh, it's almost a given, it's almost expected. Oh yes, you've done it, you've mastered it. Now it's your turn to, uh, to, give, you know, to give it back. There's something very interesting, I think, um, in the, uh, when you're trained in a certain way or trained in a certain style of dance that there's oftentimes like an imitation. How, are, how do you imitate the thing that you've been taught? And then when you fail at the imitation, that's where you sort of find your style and who you are mm. um, in, in sort of that in failure to live up in, uh, to, you know, sort of standards or ideals that uh, were given to you. So I think there's something really neat about um, failing in the process too and learning from that. I know that, um, that the world has certainly changed since like, George Floyd's murder and COVID. Do you see the dance world becoming more, uh, more diverse, more inclusive, uh, especially in classical that dance? If if ballet is the foundation of everything, uh, do we see that becoming um, loosening its grip in a way? Uh, especially with the influences of hip hop and and more contemporary dances uh, and that vocabulary coming into the world. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, if you, you know, I, I just finished a work on on Hubbard Street, um, and before when you saw Hubbard Street, you may have seen one or two at most uh, 
African Americans or people of color on stage uh, at that at at that time for as many years. It's been forty five years now, as they've been in existence, and it's not until these last couple of years has it changed, and certainly it has changed with the new artistic director. Uh, who happens to be a, a black woman and uh, who danced. She was one of those few black one women who danced wow. with uh, Hubbard Street, yes, um, who also came from Alvin Ailey, you know, mm -hmm. uh, Linda Denise. And um, it's wonderful to see that. And now you see the audience that is diverse as the people are on stage it makes a huge difference. So yes, many of them are becoming more inclusive uh, in their search to find people of color to uh, to join them. So, um, and oops, and this includes, sorry about that. This includes um, uh, a number of the classical dance companies, New York City Ballet, American Ballet Theater. I mean, these uh, are prominent dance companies that are now uh, offering positions for people of color. Yeah, I do think that um, you know our conception of what is classical is certainly changing. Because um, before in dance, it would be like, well, classical dance is ballet. But I think that's changing in a way that we're thinking about it more about what is foundational dance. And um, the foundations of American concert dance aren't just ballet. Uh, there's it's African dance, it's jazz, uh, and so you know, foundational classical dance. It, you know, uh, is West African dance. It's uh, Afro-Cuban dance, uh, and and those sort of lineages are, are as, as much apparent in American concert dance um, as as classical ballet is. Um, and so I think that in educational spaces, uh, the understanding of what is classical and what is foundational to um, the career that we're pointing students to really has to embrace um, the, 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 all of the building blocks and not just, you know, the ones that we keep stacking. That's such an interesting way of thinking about it, the stacking of, uh, of uh, sort of our preconceived priorities around mm -hmm. sort of what is foundational, what is mm -hmm. classical. Uh, I, I think about sort of in, in, you know, in education generally, the hierarchy of subjects, you know, there's math and science sort of at the top and then maybe humanities and then the arts. And even within the arts, right? There's this hierarchy of visual art and music, uh, which almost every school has. Mm -hmm. And then maybe if you're lucky, you got theater, but almost nobody has dance mm -hmm. unless you're coming to uh, a, an academy like Chicago Academy or Shy Arts or, or a place like that. How do we elevate uh, dance especially in communities of color, especially uh, making it acceptable for young men who of color who, who may love to dance because, because certainly hip hop has a, this kind of masculinity attached to it or performance of masculinity attached to it. How do we, how do we move from there into the kind of modern dance, contemporary dance world that both of you inhabit? Mm -hmm. I think one thing is um, meeting young dancers where they are and not sort of uh, coming at them from like, oh, you have a deficit because you never studied this. And so in order to, to, to be a great dancer, you have to study this. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I um, had a mentor once who, um, she had a really great analogy. She was like, Mark, if you plucked somebody from the street and told them, that they, you were gonna teach them to sing. And the first thing that you taught them to do was opera. They okay. would say, no, I don't wanna do this. This is, this is too hard, this is too difficult. So you have to meet them where they are. And sometimes where they are is they grew up dancing in churches or they grew up dancing with friends. Um, and so to, to honor that and respect that and say that that's just as valid a dance form uh, 
Um, you may not have danced on a Marley floor with bars and mirrors, but you dance. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and that is the invitation. That's the inroads. Um, and I'm not saying that modern dance or ballet or, or anything is, you know, at the pinnacle. Um, because so often we see that these forms that uh, people pay lots of money to go see and produce often borrow from forms that were invented um, in alleyways um, and uh, in, in dance halls. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, paying homage is different, for me at least, paying homage is different than um, uh, sort of borrowing, you know, it's, you, you have to acknowledge um, and really uh, respect the forms that, that we all come into the dance studio with. I mean, you know, when we first start dancing, it's because there is joy and there is an exuberance and there's a vitality inside of our movement. Um, and so any way that keeps that alive and keeps that spark um, from diminishing, I think is perfectly valid. Um, and that's really a way to ensure that, you know, that young folks of color understand that it's okay, be, that, that their dance experience is different than, than the, the greater concert dance world. And that's okay. Um, because the greater concert dance world is really like looking to them to, as the innovators uh, and the inventors of what is coming next. You know, I think about how we got jazz dance and it's because, you know, um, you know, folks were doing swing dance and um, and jitterbug and Lindy hop. And then somebody came in and wrote those things down and then, you know, disseminated that and turned it into jazz dance. Um, and I feel like TikTok is the same way. TikTok operates in the same way as, um, you know, those dance halls uh, uh, in Harlem and, you know, the, the 19, well, the early 1900s, as my students like to call it, <laughs> um, you know, and it's like, oh, this is somebody who's doing something really cool. And so now I'm going to borrow that and I'm going to copy it and I'm going to turn it into something else. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the work that's happening on TikTok, the work that's happening is the same work that was happening, you know, uh, at parties and uh, on the street and uh, it, with, with dance crews. Um, so it's, it's really about changing the mindset of what dance has to look like in order for it to be accepted. Yeah, and uh, that is so true. That is so true. There's not a whole lot I need to add to that. But I will say that actually, uh, even ballet started uh, in Africa. I mean, the- Oh, really? Yes, yeah, so it was the African dance that then moved up into this more highly sophisticated looking form of dance but you know those rhythms and things they happen way back uh, a few hundred years ago um so uh we do want to meet these kids where they are and then uh continue to elevate them and just let them know steps are steps when you really look at it it's how you go about training them to make it that much greater uh, in which they can do practically anything. And that's, that's what we're working towards. Still to this day, the only companies that are union, uh, are getting paid union wages are the big ballet companies. So you have very few with the exception of Alvin Ailey that are getting paid union salaries mm. or in the union and um it makes a difference in in how these professionals live their lives uh because then they don't have to go out and have uh other jobs like waiting tables and so forth mm -hmm. but um it really takes some true understanding of the world in which we live and yes those uh, ballet companies are borrowing from the contemporary companies. Uh, so every uh, major ballet company now has contemporary works. And that comes from, you know, us meeting those dancers where they were. Is, are we seeing um, in dance less gendering of roles? Uh, that's 
a very good question because we are now getting into this uh, kind of um, free flowing, if you will. It's very new to many of us who are used to the traditional roles of male and female. And we got these uh, binary uh, folks that are coming in or dancers that are coming in and uh, which I think is wonderful because again, it's, it's all inclusive and whatnot, but you have to have the choreographers that are interested in using those individuals in or those artists in that way. Um, for instance, Mark was mentioning much earlier that traditionally, you know, the male is lifting the female. Uh, I've worked with several female companies only. Uh, they didn't have any males in their company, so I had to do something with them. But I did have to make the changes uh, with them there. There's certain uh, movement that I would not give a female that I would give a male. Mm. For instance. Yeah. Besides lifting, like, what would those oh, be? oh, there, uh, gosh, there's percussive movement that just doesn't look the same on a male than a female. Certain percussive movements, I should say. Mm. Uh, not all. Yeah, because then it seems as though they're taking the other role and uh you just have to be careful when you're doing it mm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. i think um for me what choreography boils down to is an expression of values um an expression of um and one of my favorite things to say is that you know uh what we're putting on stage is what we are teaching people to applaud for um, and so the, you know, if me, if I, as a choreographer want to come into a space and I say that these are what my values are, um, when it comes to gender or ethnicity or any aspect of identity, um, and I want to make it inclusive, I have to create a system and a structure inside of my choreography that remains true to that. Because mm -hmm. if I want for an audience to you know, at the end of a 90 minute performance to walk out of that space, having applauded for something, I want it for it to mean some, you know, mean something to them. I want it to sit with them. I want it to um, create dialogue and conversation about the work that was seen and that work was experienced. Uh, and not just for the audience, but for the dancers too, because as dancers, we're told that we have to be pliable and moldable and have to adapt to everything that a choreographer says. Mm. Um, and so how can I, as a choreographer, uh, create space and room for dancers to explore more than I am, more than the, the, the step or the transition from one step to another, what, where is there greater room for that artistry? Um, and, you know, a, a, a work that I made recently for Dance Work Chicago explored, um, um, queerness, uh, and was, um, uh, and it was made in collaboration with um, uh, a queer poet and a queer composer. And the work was really about the exploration of um, queer trauma on the body. And so for me, it was important that the movement wasn't necessarily gendered in a way that it was sort of identifiable. Oh yeah, that this is a man's step or this is a woman's step. I was like, no, these are just steps. These are gonna be steps and anybody in the company should be able to dance this. Um, and so I wanted to make sure that that was, um, that that was visible and that was clear. Uh, and so, you know, yeah, I'm, try I'm really trying to, to think about um, choreography in such a way that it expresses the things that I value or the things that I would like for other people to value, um, uh, you know, so yeah. I know that dance is much more expressive um, and interpretive than say theater. Uh, um, and we tend to perceive sort of those actors on stage as the as real people, the 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 people, those characters, right? Uh, and certainly in in terms of sort of um, 
classic literature, classic theatrical literature, there is uh, often pushback. Uh, I think about sort of the, the pushback that we get around A Christmas Carol, uh, where whenever we uh, deviate at all from what is considered sort of the classic text, right? Whether, whether uh, uh, we cast uh, females in the uh, two women in the roles of Fezziwig, whether it's uh, whether it's uh, a person of color mm -hmm. in the role of Tiny Tim, is that same kind of pushback in in dance when we think about sort of the expansion of uh, sort of ideas of queerness, ideas of sort of uh, loosening the binary uh, as we think about sort of the world in general. I, you know, I feel it's really up to the choreographer and how comfortable they are with what they deem as their, their own style and their own person, because everybody is not going to be into it, to uh -huh. be quite honest. Um, some folks can do stuff and say, I'm good with this, and others really are into this is me, and this is what I want to do, and um, I am a traditionalist, and I don't want to go there. So you will have that. Uh, others are totally open, and uh, I think more and more uh, folks are, are opening up their minds uh, because it's a challenge uh, as far as your creativity is concerned as well. And um, a lot of us like a challenge. And I know that I do. Um, and so uh, it just takes a little bit of uh, creative thinking <laughs> uh, to make sure that these things are covered. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, there are people who will never go there. Yeah. They just simply won't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I, I, I think it has a lot to do with um, like presenting bodies and presenting organizations that uh, and their willingness to take certain risks in hiring particular choreographers to work with certain dancers or certain companies or to, to make something new. Um, and that risk largely, I think, has to do with how audiences are going to accept it. Um, you know, and, and this sort of posturing of what the, the work is and why it's meaningful or why it's important or, or why we deserve to be talking about it after we see it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I think it really depends. Um, you know, I think, I think Randy is absolutely right that there are uh, some, uh, that there are very much traditionalists who are like, oh, well, it's gonna be this way because it's always been this way and it works and it does work. Mm -hmm. um, and but there's a lot of risk involved in trying to deviate from that and then maintain an audience and build an audience, mm -hmm. you know? Um, yeah. So it, it's a gamble. Uh, yeah. So a uh, final question, two parts. Where do you see dance in five years and where do you want to see dance in five years? Well, for me, uh, in five years, um, I mean, we're, we're working towards that right now. <laughs> um, I'd like to see a bit more inclusiveness uh, with, uh, with the major dance companies uh, in particular. I mean, you know, what they call in New York, the downtown companies have always been there and working their butts off and still they have to hold uh, these other jobs or be a part of six other different dance companies, you know. Um, so there, there, there is that. Uh, and uh, I would like to see a lot of these smaller dance companies getting paid a bit better. <laughs> that's what. That's really, really where I would like. What I would like to see, because I've got these students who are graduating from the academy, and they need some place to go. They need some employment. So, um, I mean, that's real. That is real. Why else be in it? 
but for the love of it and for the passion of it if you can't live in it so that's that's what I would like to see. Yeah, I, I like to think of myself as a dance futurist. I'm always thinking about what is the possibility, what could happen next? Um, and you know, with, with, uh, with COVID shutting everything down, we had to learn how to bring dance onto Zoom or dance onto your phone. I mean, the, you know, dance is happening all the time on this thing. Uh, and kids all over the world are, probably dancing more than they ever have be, because somebody in their, you know, in their living room in uh, Western Kentucky made up a dance. And now somebody in Malaysia and somebody in India and somebody in Norway, they're all doing the same dance. Mm. Um, so I, I think that there's going to be, um, uh, you know, we, we had to learn how to bring dance and theater to screens. I think the next step is how do we bring screens to, to dance and theater? How can we take what we learned from the, the pandemic times and that struggle and how do we um, find a third way that mm. isn't just, you know, here or isn't just there sitting in that, in that seat? Um, you know, and I think that uh, where dance is going, uh, you know, I do a lot of research with, um, augmented and virtual reality. And I think there's so much room to explore and to experiment in these virtual spaces um, uh, without saying, you know, without, uh, uh, you know, I don't want to blow up a theater, you know, I, I want to still go to the theater, but I also want to be able to experience dance comfortably from anywhere in the world at any time and to see what possibility there is there. Um, so I think that there, we are on the precipice of really, really big things um, in, in performing arts and especially with the, uh, the sort of crucible that the pandemic put us through. Um, it's going to be very interesting to see how uh, dance makers and dancers are utilizing technology in new ways. I mean, you know, 10 years ago, when I was learning a dance, I would have to remember it and write it down. Now I pull this out and I film it so that I can watch it on the train on my way to rehearsal so that I remember, so I can put it in my body as I'm, you know, uh, uh, commuting. Uh, so it's a very different time. Uh, so I'll, I'll be curious to see how, where we go um, and, uh, and to talk about, you know, the implications of, uh, you know, chat GPT in, artificial intelligence when it comes to creating work. Yeah. Um, so it's it's a big, bold, maybe a little scary world, but it's there. Well, listen, I could, I could talk to you two all day. Uh, <laughs> I really appreciate you joining in this conversation. Randy Duncan, Mark Macarenas, uh, thank you so much. And thank all of you for joining us for this conversation as well. Uh, if you haven't seen it, please try to see Antonio's song uh, and go see some dance anywhere. There's lots of incredible dance in Chicago area and do some dancing, uh, yeah. whether it's just in your living room or on a stage someplace. Thank you all. Thank you uh, and good evening. Have a pleasant Sunday. Thank you, Rola. Thank you so much.